Hi, I'm Leslie Allen. I'm going to start our bite sized PD today. And our PD is going to be on a framework for implementing um, WISER. So, as we're thinking about what WISER is and how we might use that in our classrooms, um, I want us to think about WISER and how it's used for language. Okay, I'm recording. Okay, um, so for today, we're going to be spending our time talking through, um, again, the WISER framework and how we can think about planning using WISER. WISER is really all about um, maximizing opportunities to respond for students to scaff and to scaffold those, those responses. So when we think about high quality um, academic responses, Almost all responses or engaging strategies that we um, embed in our classrooms are for students to either talk with one another, to read something, or to write something. And so as we're thinking about WISER, really we want to think about it just um, as opportunities to respond and making sure that those opportunities to respond are language appropriate for our students. And, it, and then how do we scaffold them, those opportunities, if they're not um, able to do some of those pieces. And so that's where we're going to spend our time today in our framework. As we're thinking about WISER, we're going to think about a simple framework to get our brains rolling on how we can embed these language and literacy pieces into our classroom on a daily basis to make sure that our classrooms are engaging and that literacy um, is embedded daily because it's so important. And our success criteria is that we'll know um, when we can explain WISER and how to embed WISER into our everyday instruction. So if we think about WISER again, um, WISER is about writing, inquiry, speaking and listening, reading and viewing. And again, those are the ways that kids engage with all the content that you have um, in your classroom. If you think about any OTR or opportunity to respond, um, a think pair share is a speaking and listening portion. Um, a quick write is a writing portion. Annotating something from your text is reading and viewing. Looking at a graph or a data table and trying to understand meaning from it is reading and viewing. Asking an essential question is inquiry. Um, so all of these, all of the things that you're having kids do hopefully relate back to WISER and then being intentional about making sure that we have those strategies in our everyday instruction and that we've scaffolded them appropriately for the language learners in our classrooms is really important as well. So you can see here, um, WISER is the form of engagement and it does allow us to get to deeper engagement and it allows for rigor for all and high expectations. So if we're setting up our inquiry right or our, good, our essential question appropriately, it helps our students understand the relevance of what they're learning and it also provides um, more opportunities for engagement, which increases the rigor for all of our students. So, and again, it also provides scaffolds for students who need supports with their language. It also helps to make student thinking visible to us because if we can hear them speaking and if we can see them viewing and speaking about what they're viewing and we can see them writing about what they're reading and speaking about, then we know um, a little bit more about what they're learning in our classrooms and how they're understanding and engaging with content. When we think about wiser and planning, um, I really like this statement. It provides opportunities to ensure that all students receive necessary scaffolds and supports in order for them to access grade level content through language and serve as an umbrella for how everything we do is connected. So again, how do we make sure that we have those engaging opportunities to provide the rigor and relevance, but also to scaffold to ensure that every student in our classroom has those opportunities for language. So, um, in a book called Success in Science, um, through dialogue, reading, and writing is where I was first kind of introduced to a framework for science literacy, but I think it applies to WISER, and it could apply not just to science, but to every content area. So for instance, um, in his book, Arthur Beauchamp is the author of this book. He talks through how um, we want to set up an engaging purpose for our lesson, which he calls our engaging opportunity, but we're going to call inquiry. It's the same thing. 
Inquiry could be our essential question or our purpose for learning or that relevance. And I'll, we'll share some examples here in a minute. So Arthur um, in his book suggested that for every opportunity that we have or engaging opportunity we have for students, we really should be thinking about these three things. How do we make sure that students have something to purposely read during that lesson? How do we ensure that kids are productively speaking and listening during that? lesson and what sort of meaningful writing activities are we providing for our students during that lesson? And this is going to lead to success in science or success in any subject um, because it allows our students to become the critical thinkers as they're um, learning meaning from the things that they're working on. So I'm going to give you a science example and then um, maybe we'll share another example, but this is an easy framework to just get you started. So for instance, in science, we have a standard about energy changes and, and how energy changes when we're going through phase changes in matter. So uh, our inquiry question or our phenomena exp exploration might be, how does temperature change during evaporation? So you can see that that's an essential question. Um, it would probably also lead to some form of lab or inquiry exercise. But then once I have that opportunity, how do I dive deeper and make sure students understand it? I don't want them walking away thinking um, the science activity or lab was really fun. I want them walking away understanding why we saw what was happening. So um, if I'm thinking about how I want to structure my day, I think about, okay, what do I need them to purposefully read? I'm going to allow them to do an inquiry lab, and they're going to track the temperature of um, water as it boils until until we start to see evaporation. So I'm going to let them do that with, and collect a lot of data without a lot of meaning yet. And then I want them to do some readings, some from some informational text. So maybe that comes from my textbook, maybe that comes from a different source. Um, and then I'm going to want them to do some think pair share after maybe each one of those paragraphs to ensure that they're understanding it. So I'm gonna provide them with a speaking and listening opportunity as they're doing some reading. And then I want to make sure that they're doing some meaningful writing. So before they leave, I want them to make a claim about how that temperature changed. And I want them to use evidence from the text to support their claim. And so as we're thinking about that, I, I have put reading, speaking and listening and writing all in my all in my lesson plan that is about how temperature changes during evaporation. Now, as you're thinking about, okay, this is what I'm gonna have them do. Now, how am I going to scaffold some of these opportunities for my students? So um, maybe you have a, a room full of students who are multilingual learners and they need some language supports, or maybe you have several learners in your classroom who don't necessarily meet the benchmark for reading just yet and are still working on becoming proficient readers. There are a lot of different opportunities that we can use to scaffold for them. So a great one is something called dyad reading where um, I'm gonna partner my students up. They're actually going to read out loud the informational text together. And then I'm going to give them a summary protocol that they're going to follow. So as they read about evaporation in their informational text, they're going to read it together with a partner. They're gonna follow a summary protocol so that by the end of that text, the two of them have been able to work and think about that text together to come up with a summary. When they're done with that, I'm going to allow them to do some speaking and listening and think pair share with a different partner from a different group to allow an expanded um, opportunity to hear what other people have read about and how they connected what they learned from their informational text back to the inquiry lab that we did. And then but that is going to be the scaffold that is going to help support them with their writing. Um, my good friend, Susan Henry, who works in my department, always says that writing floats on a sea of talk. And really to get kids to do meaningful writing, they have to co-construct those ideas, those big ideas with a partner um, or co-construct those ideas out loud before they're able to put those ideas into writing. So allowing students to talk through those pieces first before I have them do that writing is another way of scaffolding that writing. And as I'm having them do their writing, I'm going to scaffold it by giving them some sentence stems. So my claim is that blank because um, a piece of evidence from paragraph blah in this informational text blah states that. And so I would give them some sentence frames to help them 
through that. And so WISER, you can see, is this framework of how do I get my kids to engage in language activities? But then we go a few steps further. How am I going to scaffold those language activities so that all my students can accept, access those? Um, and so I do have another um, a, a social studies example that maybe we could share. So maybe their essential question is, how does the culture of blank Native American Indian tribe meet their social and economic needs? So in this one, maybe their purposeful reading is really just a gallery walk of, of artifacts from a Native American culture. And all they're doing is starting to look at some of the artifacts from this culture and try to gain some meaning from them. So they might not even be reading at this point, they're viewing something. So remember reading and viewing go together. So at this point, they're looking at something on um, some sort of artifact or a picture of an artifact. Students are walking around and as they walk around, they're going to start writing notes about these objects um, in post-it note questions during their gallery walk. And I would provide them with some sentence stems. And so they're building as they're walking through silently and then they're going to have an opportunity to share those post-it notes with those sentence stems with a partner when they're done. And then students might be able to start thinking through, um, pick an artifact and how might that artifact help us to explain the specific culture of a tribe, or maybe they read some more informational text about cult the culture of this tribe and what some of these artifacts look like so that then they can write something meaningful before they leave class that day. So that's how we would set up. Um, I think if we just think about those three steps, you know, what's my engaging opportunity? What's my essential question or my inquiry uh, opportunity? And then how can I make sure that I get those three opportunities there during my class time? And maybe this takes two days instead of one day, um, but we want to make sure kids are always doing those things um, in class. So I, I provided a few um, supports for you. So if you're thinking, I'm not exactly sure how to scaffold for writing, um, I'm not a writing teacher and I'm not sure what sort of scaffolds to would best support my students. Um, I, I provided you a few different links here. So this link is to an article that talks about these specific writing strategies. So how to use sentence stems and sentence frames, how to use exemplar text, how to use and build interactive word walls, how to model writing for students and how to use quick writes. Um, in addition to the article, I also connected um, just a short little article about sentence stems and how we might be using those in our classrooms. Some examples of them, how to make them a little bit more complex. So there's a bunch of different ways for you to um, use those sentence stems or sentence frames and those writing scaffolds in your classroom. Um, reading scaffolds. Again, I wanted to provide some support. So as you're having your students do some reading, um, you can think through where do my kids, where are my kids at and what is the complexity of this text? So I, maybe I'm reading something that's very complex to my students and um, I, they aren't gonna be able to access it by reading it independently or even with a partner at this juncture. I could do something called a close reading where I'm reading the majority of text, but I'm stopping occasionally and they're filling in the blanks. And the reason this works well is because the students are going to hear me read it the first time, but I know that they're following along because when I pause, they're going to have to fill in the next word. So in order to, they have to actually follow along in order to do that. And if your class isn't responding and they're all not saying the word, then you know that they're not following along. And so it's an accountability measure for students to be able to follow along with you and do some reading with you as the teacher. Um, whisper reading is a strategy where students would whisper as they read and read it a little bit more out loud because sometimes um, kids need to hear themselves read it and hearing it actually helps them comprehend it a little bit better. And another strategy that's very scaffold is called dyad reading. And again, I put a link in there so you can look that up, but essentially we could precision partner our kids based on reading levels and allow, those, allow two students that you precision partner to be partners together they read the text out loud together. Um, that way the stronger reader is able to read the words, the weaker reader can hear them pronounce words that they maybe don't know or understand. And it allows them to access the text even if they can't read or pronounce every single word in the text. So it's a great strategy to use um, in your classroom and there's a link there on how to set that up. There's also, I just put a few links to some other strategies, um, how to, teach your students how to summarize, and there's some different protocols and strategies there. 
And a lot of us are already using good annotation strategies, but I, I popped a link in there for how to annotate text as well. Um, the last is speaking and listening. And sentence stems and paragraph frames are one of the best ways to scaffold for speaking and listening. So a lot of times um, students, maybe multilingual learners are, are a little afraid to speak up in or to say things because they're worried that they'll say them incorrectly, but having your sentence stem or a paragraph frame and actually practicing it and reading it out loud before those students have to practice it themselves um, could be really helpful. So having those pre-made is a great way to do that. Um, I gave you a few other um, strategies to use. And again, I put links in there. So if you don't know what these strategies are, you can check here and, and think through them. Structured partnering, assigned partners, structured classroom discussion. We have a ton of materials on um, in our instructional guides, and it's one of the best, I think, for speaking and listening. So it's in all of your instructional guides. Um, it's in, as you look through your instructional guides, it's in your instructional priorities um, carrot, and then in the academic carrot under structured classroom discussion. So you can see in here we have talk moves for teachers. We also have these discussion frames. And so you can pull from this list of discussion frames. So maybe your students are arguing about or, or making claims about something in, in a, your science classroom. I think that this is happening because, and someone else has a claim that they think it's happening because, a great way to support that conversation is to allow kids to build on or challenge others' ideas or to state their opinions. And we can do that and teach them how to do that in a kind and polite way using some of these sentence stems. So civil dialogue is important and we can actually use this to help them. Sometimes the setting up of your classroom um, is important when you're structuring a discussion. So I need my kids, I want them to take two different sides and have two different viewpoints. So I might set my class up like a runway or I wanna do a Socratic seminar. So I might set it up as a fishbowl. And so we have a lot of different um, ways to support structured conversations in your classroom. So this um, in your instructional guides might be helpful. We also have implementation tools where there's videos to watch, et cetera. So I feel like this one has a lot of resources if that's something that you're interested in learning more about. And that's all I have for you today. My name again is Leslie Allen. I'm the middle school science specialist. And if you have any questions about um, a wiser framework and how to plan wiser in your classroom, please reach out. Have a great day.